And welcome to another episode of the Illini Cast. This is, I think, our third or fourth episode this week already. And we keep producing it because that's what Illini Nation wants. You guys love your basketball content. And so we're going to do our best to keep turning it out for you. In return, all we ask for is a little like, subscribe uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, where you can find us on your favorite podcast platform. We're on Apple uh, Podcasts, Spotify, uh, Pocket Cast, whatever you use. You know, that's the best way we know that someone's consuming the content and we're not doing this for no reason. Um, as for this episode, uh, we're going to talk about the big uh, game on Saturday, Saturday at 11 o'clock between uh, the Illinois Fighting Illini and the Tennessee Volunteers. And to give us a Tennessee perspective, I'm now going to be bringing in Drew Nicholson from uh, ATB Vols. And uh, Drew, uh, if you don't mind, just uh, tell the fine folks watching this where they can find you. Yeah, so I mean, you can find me uh, either at my podcast's credentials, which is Vols underscore ATB, or even at my own personal Twitter or X or whatever you really want to call it at this point, uh, at I am Drew Man. Um, every week we have, you know, we discuss Tennessee football, Tennessee basketball, even during the spring months, even a little bit Tennessee baseball as well. But this is definitely our prime time area, if I shout it out, because uh, this is definitely the prime area for college basketball, for sure. But yeah, either at Balls ATB or at I am Drew Man, where you can find me on uh, social media credentials, for sure. Now, Drew, actually, before we deep uh, talk about the basketball game on Saturday, uh, usually yeah. when I have a guest on who has a prominent football team, I'd, I'd like to just ask the question. <laughs> you know, it doesn't. It can be on a very high level. What's the mood in Vol Nation uh, on the football field? Well, I mean, to you know, last year was such a historical season from a lot of regards, whether it feels, you know, beating Florida at home for the first time in seven years or beating Alabama for the first time since 2006 or winning 11 games for the first time since 2001. There was a lot of historical remarks and regards that happened last year. It was a very special season. I, you know, it's weird. It's like, for me, it's like, I don't really consider it that much of a disappointment going eight and four, just because, you know, you lose a Heisman contender at quarterback, a first round draft pick on that offensive line, a Blitnikoff winner under Jalen Hyatt wide out. Um, but, you know, losing to Florida at the way we did was pretty bad. Losing to Missouri was definitely a, certainly a disappointment for sure. But, you know, I think this is the most confidence that f the fan base has had under this program, under Josh Heupel. Especially since, you know, since Philip Fulmer um, and his staff has had back 15, 16 years ago. So even despite, you know, a little bit of a drop off compared to the season before, uh, you know, potentially winning nine games if you beat Iowa, of course, and, you know, Iowa's got an unbelievable defense. Um, it, I think it still would be a pretty successful season with all things considered. Now, we can jump into basketball a little bit. Uh, but yeah. that Iowa game is going to be fun to watch. Uh, you know, it's – It'll be uh, interesting. <laughs> you can watch them, you know, week in and week out. And, you know, they keep throwing low unders out there. And every game ends up going under. So, uh, last time I checked, uh, yours was at like 36, 36 and a half or something along those lines. Yeah. And uh, I'll be honest with you. I don't think we're going to hit that. I really don't. Uh, <laughs> Iowa, Iowa's defense is one of the best in the country, but uh, they might have, and I'm not even being sarcastic when I say this, of course, they might have the worst offense I've ever seen in Division One college football. It's it's truly remarkable, honestly. It's it's amazing um, the fact that they've won, what's it, nine or ten games this year? Ten games, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Only it's playing incredible. with two, two of the three sides of a, a football team. It's, uh, you know, Illinois, we we're – beating them for the better part of the game. And then uh, they won in Iowa fashion at the end of the fourth quarter. So uh, this is just what Iowa football does. So, you know, that's going to be an interesting game to watch. Um, speaking of interesting games to watch, you know, there's going to be an exciting one Saturday in Knoxville uh, with your Tennessee Volunteers. Um, obviously, you know, the, the, they come in with a five and three record. You know, Illinois comes in at seven and one, but that five and three is deceiving. I mean, you have losses against, uh, what was it, Purdue, yep. uh, North Carolina, and Arizona, was it? Who was it? Was it? Kansas. It was Kansas. 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 You're yeah. talking the one and two team in the country <laughs> at that point. So, I mean, if anyone's been battle-tested, it's been you guys. Um, oh, yeah. What were the expectations coming into the season this year? Um, you know, 
at least from my perspective, right, and I'm a I'm a diehard Tennessee basketball fan. I mean, I would I'd actually consider my Tennessee basketball fandom at the same level as Tennessee football, if not maybe a tiny bit more because I've seen that success from like the Bruce Pearl era and you know, even beforehand. But I think a lot of the expectation, you know, of having Josiah Jordan James returning, Santiago Vescovi, Sakai Ziegler, uh, having Dalton Connect from Northern Colorado come in, I think the expectation was more or less with this team was that this is a team, this is the most completed team that Tennessee's had under the Rick Barnes era. This is a team that not only can compete for the SEC championship, not just a regular season and tournament, but potentially a Final Four run. And I think a lot of fans think that like if this team doesn't make it at least to the Sweet 16 or Elite 8, um, that it would be considerably a failure, more or, more or less. And so this is the most loaded team from a roster perspective, not just a starting five, but I think probably just all together, including you know, your six-man and the bench, uh, as far as from a talent perspective that Tennessee's had under Rick Barnes. And so there's a very high expectation. I think, and that's honestly the reason why, I know there's probably not a lot of Illinois fans have seen how Tennessee fans have reacted under the last, you know, three losses that we had. So we had three in a row. And uh, I think our fan base doesn't really correlate to the fact that, like, as a basketball program, you're going to drop some games that you shouldn't drop or you think that you should win or compete at a high level. But I think that's why a little bit they were a bit antsy and a bit nervous going to this game on Saturday because Illinois is a very good basketball team, of course. But um, I still think the expectation, at least in my regard, is being an Elite Eight, a Final Four, even potentially a national title team. Um, it's just from the one to five position. Yeah, I've never seen this much talent as far as, you know, a Tennessee basketball team goes. And I agree. Uh, you know, Illinois, obviously, I'm more well versed in them. Um, I consider I, us one of the most, you know, we have eight, nine guys we can run on the court at any time without really putting a minus on the court. Yeah. And um, going into our schedule, we tend to be the better team when it came to depth. When I was doing a little scouting on Tennessee, I think Tennessee has us matched, if not, you know, uh, has uh, even more physicality. Uh, I think that's going to be an interesting part uh, of the game to watch. So for Illinois fans who, you know, let's just say, let's be honest, you know, you probably know very little about the Illinois side. Right. Just like we know a little bit on the Tennessee side. Sure. What, what should we expect to watch to see on the other side? Like, you know, is the battle of the orange. Uh, let's see, like, you know, what's uh, Tennessee going to bring, you know, offensively, defensively, what kind of, who are we looking at? You know, what key players, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, if, if there's anything that you should know about Tennessee basketball or Rick, Rick Barnes, especially for that matter, is very defense oriented, very intense up in your face. I mean, this is a Tennessee basketball team. And it's not just, some, you know, not just this team, but just in general, um, that draw a lot of fouls and play extremely physical, you know, a lot of man-to-man especially. You don't really see them play a lot of zone. So you should expect that. You should expect, I think, you know, especially for like Terrence Shannon, you know, to expect a lot of intense guard play from Zakai Ziegler and Vescovy uh, going into Saturday. But, you know, the, the very unique thing about this Tennessee basketball team this year especially is that there's been a bit of a different trend when it comes offensively, which is traditionally under Rick Barnes, you know, they like to play, you know, a very, you know, strong post game, try to draw up some fouls, try to get those, you know, 10, 12 footers. But this year and, you know, a little bit towards the end of last season, they kind of like went different towards that trend, which is like a lot of three point shots. If there's like a 16, 17 footer, a lot of those guards include, you know, uh, you know, Dalton Connect, Josiah Jordan James, Vescovy. Uh, Ganey as well, especially, they take a lot of those, you know, risky shots more or less. And so I would say probably the big thing that you should expect from this team is, A, Dalton Connect attacking the basket every single time. Once that man gets the ball, if he doesn't have a wide-open three-point shot, he's going to either, A, attack the basket or try to dish it out to Zakai or Ganey or Vescovy. And another thing I kind of expect for this team especially is try to, you know, establish more of a post game with uh, Jonas Adu and Toby Awaka as well. And so they tried to do a little bit of a combination of those things. And, like, it was a little bit, you know, it didn't work out against Kansas or Purdue. But, you know, they did fairly well against, you know, North Carolina, all things considered, even though allowing over 100 points, but dropping 92 and scoring a little bit over 80 against Wisconsin as well. And so I would say probably at least from an Illinois perspective, expect quite a few three-point shots. I'd say anywhere between 15 or 20 three-point shots in that game. And uh, a lot of, like, midfield, like, you know, 15, 16-foot, two-point jumpers as well. 
which should be interesting because Illinois, yeah. I think, was second or third in the country right now in effective yeah. field goal percentage, uh, you know, allowed, you know, uh, to our opponent. So we're talking about strength versus strength here. And, you know, I'm just going to say it again. Like, I, I genuinely think Saturday is going to be one of the better games for both teams um, this season just because they really match up pretty well. You, know, you talk about trying to establish a post game and, like one of Illinois' strengths is we have a lot of bigs. You know, we are one mm-hmm. of the biggest teams in the – not just the Big Ten, in the country. So we have a lot of guys that, you know, we can throw at you. And, you know, if one guy gets into foul trouble, we can kind of bring in another one. So that's going to be, you know, very interesting to watch, just the X and O's battle between Brad Underwood uh, and Rick Barnes. Uh, right. Me personally, I think what I'm most looking forward to is – the Terrence Shannon against Connect show. Because yeah. <laughs> normally Shannon walks in, especially this year, he's reached an extra level of um, confidence where he's really trying to establish himself as the alpha uh, every time he steps on the court. And he has been. And this is going to be one of the first games where he's going to go up against somebody who has had big offensive explosion games himself. Mm-hmm. And so I think, you know, in order for Illinois to be victorious in this game, ultimately, yeah. you know, uh, we're going to kind of dub this the Terrence Shannon game, but uh, can you give me a little scouting report on uh, connect? Yeah. So I'll, I'll be honest with you. I've, uh, I've watched a lot of Tennessee basketball over the years. I've got to see some incredible players, you know, over the years, whether it feels like CJ Watson, Josh Richardson, uh, obviously Grant Williams and Admiral Schofield and Tobias Harris for sure. But I think from an all-around perspective, Dalton Connect might be the most special player I've ever seen play at Tennessee. And you you could actually argue that he's probably the most all-around player that Tennessee's had since Allen Houston, which is really speaking highly regard, uh, you know, especially for guys, you know, six or seven-time all-star player. He's the type of player where he's, uh, you know, he's very lengthy, so he's able to, you know, drive to the basket, very aggressive, has that type of physicality where, like, he's able to draw the foul, get two points. But, man, like, the thing about him, too, is, like, especially when it comes to the corner threes, is, like, once he gets set-footed and has that opportunity where he has that, you know, foot and a half or two feet from the defender, he is uh, he is deadly from the three-point range without a shadow of a doubt. And he kind of brings that extra element to Tennessee, which kind of, like, we, you know, we didn't really have last season. Because, uh, you know, Jordan J- Josiah Jordan James wasn't fully healthy last year, and so they try to expect too much from him. And it was the same with Vescovy. But he brings that presence where, like, not only he could be able to get those, you know, like, dirty, you know, deep foul kind of baskets within 10 feet or inside the paint, but he's able to get those, you know, opportunities from the three-point line as well. But I think this is a guy where, you know, he's averaging 19 points a game. He's, I think, is the most high that Tennessee, uh, Tennessee players had since Grant Williams. And I think from an all-around perspective, he's, without a doubt, in my opinion, at least a first-round draft pick in this upcoming NBA draft. But he's definitely – the most talented guy from a to, you know, whether it's from an offense perspective or defensively or from a post game uh, that Tennessee's had in quite a long time. I really think that uh, this game, the conclusion of this game is uh, capable of producing one of these guys into mm-hmm. the national player of the year conversation. I mean, Zach Eady probably has it locked up just because he is who he is, you know, the returning or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I roll. <laughs> I, I completely agree. Yeah, but uh, it'll be nice. Like I think you know, Terrence has kind of uh, introduced himself, especially with that performance he had uh, in Madison Square Garden this week. And you know, yeah, I think you know if one of these guys has a really strong thirty-plus point game um, on Saturday, they very well could kind of also enter the conversation. Um, personally, uh, yeah. Um, so uh, before you came on, I actually asked Twitter. Um, if they had any questions for you. And so okay. uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask a couple questions. Um, <clears throat> okay, sorry. The first one's for me. And okay. this is from John, Jonathan Kuhn. And I want to give a big shout out to Jonathan Kuhn. He's the one who all these cool little graphics that you see uh, are, you know, upcoming thumbnails in our backdrop here. It's all credit to him. He's a He's works with the University of Illinois. And, uh, you know, he's been a great help. So, of course, I'm going to answer his question. He asked, do you think Underwood looks to DGL, Gibbs, Laharn, a little more minutes in this one? Maybe let him play four minutes at the end of the first half after the media break and let him exp- 
get some experience playing in this type of environment and to know that he's not going to get benched after a, a single mistake. I mean, he might be. I, I don't know if this is the DGL game. Uh, he Just to give you a background, Drew, he's a, a point young point guard. This team, uh, okay. the biggest weakness we have is we don't have a point guard. Okay. We, like yeah. zero. There's a lack of point guard. It's our, our biggest Achilles heel, and the reason I think we're ultimately, you know, uh, not going to progress as far as this team's capable in March. But he is a point guard. He was a four-star recruit, um, and he's a scorer. Uh, to answer your question, Jonathan, I don't know if this is the game, just because I think Brad Underwood realizes how important of a game this could be to win. Um, I don't think Brad cares much for the regular season when it comes to the conference, you know, win, winning the conference anymore. He's done that. He's won the regular season. He's won the uh, conference tournament. A victory in this game will lead to a higher seed coming March, and that's what Brad kind of needs. I see DJL playing more uh, in like decent games uh, in the Big Ten Conference. You know, he'll play more against the Washington, or sorry, the Washington next year, the Wisconsin's, um, the Iowa's, and et cetera, et cetera, because like, that itself is going to be a pretty crazy environment too. I expect Saturday to be chaos. I think you know that's the stadium atmosphere in Knoxville. Those guys get rowdy. You know, uh, it's going to be against a very good team. I. My personal opinion is, you know, Tennessee is one of the handful of teams that on their best night could win the national championship. And if I know that, then I think Brad Underwood knows that. So I don't know if, you know, Saturday is going to be the night for him, but uh, I still think he's got a big, bright future uh, moving forward. Uh, a follow-up question for Jonathan Kuhn for you was, okay. what's going to be the key to getting easier two-point shots? Seeing on Ken Palm, Tennessee is only shooting 51% from two this season, which is 154th in the country. Meanwhile, Illinois has the best two-point defense in the country. It's going to be a tough matchup. Yeah, no, if I show it out, um, I do know that when it comes to Illinois, they only average for their opponents to allow, I think, what, shoot 37% from the field within the last six games, which includes opponents against, you know, Marquette and FAU. But very high caliber teams, especially teams that could potentially make a final four run for sure. I think the big thing for Tennessee, that, you know, this weekend is like try to establish a post game with Jonas Adu or Toby Awaka and try to be able to establish where you could be able to open up offensively. That was the big problem that we had, you know, not just against North Carolina, but Kansas as well, is that we weren't really able to establish that. And I mean, Grant, you know, you're playing against, you know, Armando Acott and Hunter Dickerson, who are, you know, and on top of that, Zachary Eady, who, Three of them are arguably the best three postmen in college basketball. So playing those in three consecutive games, you can kind of expect, you know, not to be able to establish a post game. But I think, like, the big question for Tennessee is that if they're able to establish that, does that open up the playbook a little bit, allow guys like, you know, Ganey to be able to shoot some corner threes, Dalton Connect to drive the basket without potentially, you know, turning it over because he had that big problem against North Carolina. Um, and, you know, and letting Josiah Jordan James be able to do this thing with those 10, 12 foot. Uh, 12 footers and so I think if they're able to open that I think Tennessee has a very high possibility and a very great chance to be able to pull off a win but um, you know it'll be interesting to see as well for sure if they're not able to establish that and they're trying to rely on the three-pointer I mean it kind of really all depends I mean we try to rely on that against you know Kansas and against you know uh, Purdue as well and we were shooting less than 30 percent from the field I think all together between both those games about 24 25 percent from the three-point line as well and so you can't really win a lot of basketball games when you're shooting that low, you know, and having that lot, you know, low percentage. So I think that's the main indicator for Tennessee in this basketball team. All right. And last question. Uh, oh, this is for me. Uh, do you believe Illinois will be able to succeed on offense as well as they did against FAU? Or was that a once in a lifetime game from this team? Um, I, think, <laughs> I think that was a once in a lifetime game and there's nothing. Okay. Wrong. Um, we shot lights out, you know, obviously, our two best players had 33 points uh, each in that game, uh, second and third all time in the Jimmy V Classic, a tournament that's been around for 20 plus years. And we we're also hitting our free throws. That's, uh, Drew, I, I, to let you know, another Achilles heel of ours. Um, we, Underwood's like never had a good free throw shooting team. We've never been able to figure it out. But the performance that we put on, uh, on Tuesday night, I don't think we're going to be able to replicate. But mm -hmm. That those are very very high uh, expectations to begin with. So, you know, it's just it is what it is. But you know, 
that doesn't mean we need that sort of performance to beat a Tennessee or someone moving forward. Right. Um, <clears throat> Drew, uh, you know, we just kind of talked about a little bit about the potential, uh, you know, national championship aspirations for uh, Tennessee basketball. Uh, I think we can kind of end it here. You have a head coach who, you know, let's just say, you know, come March, his name is brought up a lot for, you know, some of the performances that uh, their, his teams have had compared yeah. to, you know, the talent uh, on the court during the regular season. What's the temperature like for Rick Barnes and uh, Vol Nation? So when it comes to Rick Barnes in March, I think it's pretty well precedented, and uh, not just with the college basketball community, but Tennessee basketball especially, that uh, – I mean, I'm just going to be real. The man underperforms when it comes to March, especially the amount of talent he had, whether it goes in Texas. I mean, oh, my God, especially over here, you know, Grant and Admiral Schofield and a couple other guys especially. Um, it's definitely kind of a trend or kind of like a precedent that he has established for sure within his coaching career. But, you know, I kind of look at it from this regard. You know, he's um, he's the second wingest coach in Tennessee basketball history behind Ray Mears, and he's about to pass Ray Mears, who – you know, who was able to coach Bernard King, Ernie Grunfield, a lot of legends, you know, that established this, you know, this basketball program in itself. But he's the only guy that I have seen from Tennessee basketball, and that includes Bruce Pearl himself, where it's like he was able to establish a type of level where, A, this team is consistently a top 10, top 20 team every single year. You don't even have to worry about whether if this team's going to make the tournament or not. And, you know, he runs such a high-level program where – Unlike Bruce Pearl, and I love Bruce Pearl. I, Bruce Pearl, the Bruce Ball years over here was electric, you know, making the lead eight and everything. But you don't have to work. But, uh, Illinois fans yeah. are not fond of Bruce Pearl at all. I, so, I, under, I understand. Yeah. I know that. I know that history, especially. But I'm uh, just not going to share with you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, no. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, I, I love that. I love that little side note. Trust me. I know that personally. You know, meet him, the the fondness or anti-fondness uh, between him and Illinois for sure. But, uh, you know, like the thing is, is that the difference between that era and here is that you don't have to worry about, you know, your guys getting off the field trouble or anything like that. There, That's never been a thing here under Rick Barnes. He runs his program at an extremely high level. It's very consistent. We're always beating our team, you know, our rivals, whether it's Vanderbilt, Kentucky, or Florida. And... I mean, I understand from the perspective I'm, like, falling short. But, like, if I'm going to be honest, like, Tennessee basketball does not have that history of going far in the tournament in the first place. I mean, we only have one Elite Eight, perform, you know, appearance back in 2009. We've only made a Sweet 16 about, I believe it's about five or six times altogether. And about three of those came under Bruce. And so, I mean, you know, I think the expectations a little bit died down. And I think, like, I, I think because of how – consistent Rick Barnes has been here is set the expectation a little bit higher for this fan base. But I wouldn't say that his seat's like heated by any chance. Now I do think if if they go in a first round exit <laughs> with this team this you know this year, I think you know there's gonna be quite a few and be like, all right, like maybe it's time to like, you know, turn it to another, you know, another coach, whether if it's like Kim English from Providence or whomever. Um but I think altogether he's done an exceptional job here. It's the most consistency I've seen, and I've I've seen a lot of bad basketball under this program, whether it was Conzo Martin or Donnie Hindle or Buzz Peterson, especially. So, I think a lot of fans, for the most part, with the exception of the vocal minority, is pretty happy of being a three or four seed in the NCAA tournament every year. Well, I think it's going to be you know a fantastic game on Saturday between two teams that uh, have high aspirations this year. Um, it's going to mm-hmm. be two of the best defensive teams in the country, and it's you know it's a game that I think you know when especially when it comes to non-con games could uh, go down as one of the best uh, in the season. Drew, thank you so much for your time. Uh, if you can you know once again, if you don't mind, just telling the folks where they can find you on social media. Yeah, of course. So my personal Twitter or X or whatever you really want to call it, it is uh, I am Drew Man. Uh, it's not just for Twitter, but for Instagram as well. Um, and for the podcast that I'm on every single Wednesday or Thursday, it really depends on when anyone's off work. Uh, you know, it's Vols underscore ATB. We discuss not only, you know, just Tennessee basketball, Tennessee football content, but recently we've been trying to get a little bit more college basketball and college football world. Um, so, I mean, yeah, if you're obviously interested in looking from a different perspective, uh, feel free to hit us up, you know, balls underscore ATV. 
or my Twitter as well. I, I am Drew Man. Thank you very much, Drew. And that just about wraps up this episode of Illini Cast. Once again, uh, tell your friends if you have any, you know, Illini uh, friends, uh, fans, or whatnot, just send them a link to our YouTube, to our social media. Right now, we're a small channel, but we're trying to grow as best we can. We're trying to throw out as much content out there for you. Uh, you can find us at Illini Cast either on YouTube or all uh, on the social medias. Um, that's it for now. We'll see you. Uh, we'll probably have some kind of recap episode Saturday after the big game. So for now, I bid you all a farewell.